co-organizer, we're very excited that you came out to join us tonight. Um, it's always great to see familiar faces and also some new faces in the crowd, so if it's your first time, welcome. Tonight we are very excited to have Teresa Quinlan here to talk to us about emotional intelligence and how it's going to take your agile teams to the next level. And I happen to know Teresa personally. She is inspiring and motivated and smart. And, sorry, inspiring and motivating and smart. And I think you're all really going to enjoy tonight. And um, we have a guest on behalf of Community Tech. Uh, this, this is why. This is why. I'm this is <laughs> really what people come to see for. Love it. Yes. Yes. And just a couple of housekeeping items tonight. So um, part of the Communitech network as um, peer to peer champions were asked to promote the True North Conference, which is happening in Waterloo, June 19th and 20th, www.truenorthwaterloo.com. Um, I went last year and it really is amazing. And it's fantastic content for a, such a cheap price if you're used to traveling to another country for content like that and, and you can get it locally. Um, Please consider ordering food and drinks. The Rich Uncles Tavern has given us this room at no cost, which is amazing for us to be able to utilize a space because we don't have any budget for this Agile Lean group. That's why we get Community Tech Goat Notebooks <laughs> <laughs> as our uh, thank you gift. Um, so it's great if you can support the restaurant by uh, ordering food or, or drinks if you're able. And um, also related to Communitech, they get the funding to help host these peer-to-peer um, -peer groups by attendance. That's actual attendance, not RSVP. So that's why there are attendance sheets on your table. Oh. So if you could just write your name. Yeah, maybe a few extra names. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just between us. Um, that just helps ensure they continue to get the funding that they rely on. Um, some of the other groups have a bunch of um, And George is here recording tonight. This will be posted for any member who wants to access it afterwards. It will, there will be a link from the uh, meetup. It's also really great for the people who can't be here because they have commitments at this time. Um, so we'd like to record it. If you have any concerns about that, uh, maybe you can just ping George. Um, it's just right here so you won't really be on camera. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to, to Teresa. Thanks, Lisa. I'm really excited and happy to be here. And thanks for those of you that were sharing what we wanted to get out of today. It's a fairly broad spectrum topic. So uh, my goal is to be able to hit on almost everything that a few of you have shared with me and that you are able to take away some nuggets about what emotional intelligence really is how you can use it to, to, yes, improve your agile teams and take them to the next level. It would be really great and amazing. If you walk out of this room after 30 and 45 minutes and you could do that, that's pretty spectacular. No you, pressure, but No pressure. Yeah, I know. You still have the tone in the bottom of But also, I think um, my number one goal for you is really for you to understand your emotional intelligence. Because when you connect to yours, it's much easier to help other people connect to theirs. And the bottom line of having individuals who perform at a higher level that you're responsible for is that connection. And if you don't understand your own emotional intelligence, it's going to be very difficult to help someone else navigate theirs. So a lot of the things that you were telling me you wanted to get out of and hopefully be able to influence when you get back to work is just that. I put on uh, all the tables. There isn't enough for everyone, but there's enough to share. <laughs> Uh, a map of the EQI model on the back, there's some information about balancing. We're going to use this because I think the visual um, helps us to really sort of understand emotional intelligence a little bit better, a lot better actually, especially the balancing side of things. Emotional intelligence right now is a commodity, I'm going to put it in quotes, <laughs> because how do we actually monetize emotional intelligence? Have you ever seen a job profile that states someone needs to be emotionally intelligent under these criteria. Have you seen a performance review that does that? No. We don't, we don't see that. We're not scoring people on this scale of 1 to 10. You are emotionally intelligent or not emotionally intelligent, but we feel it. <laughs> and we see it in behaviors. So we can often always feel it in ourselves. And sometimes we're in the 
the practice of dismissing it and then behaving in a very different way because someone's watching us. <laughs> and the goal of emotional intelligence is authenticity for everybody. I'm Italian, so I'm going to do a lot of this. <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right. So my goal for you, a couple of nuggets you can take away and you feel like you understand emotional intelligence more, you understand yourself better, and you're going to be able to help other people to be successful. Sound good? Yes. 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 <laughs> We've got 30 to 45 minutes of really interactive time. I'm probably going to talk for the first 15 to make sure the foundation of emotional intelligence feels really solid for everyone. And then the rest of the 30 minutes, I hope to open up to discussion about what are you experiencing, how are you seeing it, and we'll use that model that you have in front of you to work towards solving, to work towards actual, ooh, this is something I can do, and I'm going to take this strategy away with me, and I'm going to start it, and I'm going to give it to all of my team members, or I'm going to talk to my boss about it, and maybe we're going to do some sort of an exercise together as a group. So I hope that the majority of our time is spent doing that, as opposed to really just talking about emotional intelligence. Okay? This is what I know about Agile teams, because Lisa said this to me. <laughs> and I also read a book based on my husband Steve is here, based on his recommendation, Scrum. It was fantastic, I loved it. I learned a lot of things. I come from a background of learning and development, which usually does waterfall. We had a discussion over here about waterfall earlier. And when I was reading this book, I thought, man, this would have been great. And for our learning and development team, all of these principles would have been fantastic. The framework would have been magnificent. We would have gotten a whole crap load done a lot faster and a lot cheaper and all of the great things that it's supposed to be doing. So there have been a number of studies that have been done that have demonstrated that EQ is m often matters more than your IQ. Not that it's more value, but often matters a lot more. And those studies are showing that individuals with high EQ and slightly lower IQ than their counterparts with high IQ and low EQ, the EQers are outperforming their IQers 78% of the time. That is a really high percentage and that is putting the weight of the commodity over into the emotional quotient. We're also within this practices of leading with heart. We're seeing workplaces that are getting involved in how do we take care of our people? How do we make sure that the person can flourish because this is what is going to keep our top talent? And that is all pointing towards connections and relationships. And this is the EQ side of the spectrum. It's not our intelligence that will win us our people. Because if I'm abrasive, if I'm unkind, if I'm unaware of how I'm showing up day to day, no one's going to stick around to find out how smart I am. They're all just going to head for the door and go find someone that they connect with. So how do you know that you've connected with someone? What does it feel like? This is where you participate. <laughs> you, can, you can shout it out. I, I mean, I think just saying it is good. I don't think we have to do like, raise your hand and I'll call on the girl with the fabulous hair. You laugh together. You laugh together? Wonderful. Relaxed. You're relaxed? Lots of eye contact. Lots of eye contact. Personal sharing, I guess. Yes, you get into the deep stuff. Yeah. Yes, good. You're not guarded. Sorry? You're not guarded. Not guarded? Oh, yeah, the armor. Right? When we're not emotionally intelligent, we tend to wear an armor. Natural human behaviors wear a shield to protect us because nobody likes to be rejected. But vulnerability requires us to take the armor off and connect with people. Deep connection is equivalent to a lot of the skills under emotional intelligence, like empathy. It's such an important word right now. But what does empathy mean? We had this great conversation. Is it a banana? Yes, banana shirt guy. That's how I'm remembering you. <laughs> we had this great conversation about empathy. He's like, I'm trying to be much more empathetic, but I find it very difficult to be empathetic with someone I don't agree with. I'm like, well, that's not empathy. <laughs> well, first we need to define what empathy is. And empathy is this wonderful thing, is if we've got a beach ball between you and I, and your beach ball has these three colors, and mine has these three colors, we've got to turn the beach ball so we can see the other side. That's what empathy is. It's understanding, oh, I know what anger is like because I've been angry. Maybe not about, you know, putting my lollipop into the sand, but I've been angry before, so I can empathize with your emotional state. What do you need from me right now? That's what empathy is. This is why EQ is such a great commodity, because if, if I go to work and I'm the only one there, do I need to be emotionally intelligent? And how do 
how many of you go to work and you're the only one there? Well, I do because I work myself. <laughs> Eventually, the child comes home and husband comes home with other people in my life. <laughs> so emotional intelligence is really important. You have to step over here every time you need time. So where do we start? Where do we begin? I believe we always begin here first. We begin with ourselves first. So the first model or description of emotional intelligence I want to give you is the most simplified because there are a lot of people who have done models of emotional intelligence or descriptions of emotional intelligence. This is the most simplified one. This comes from Travis Bradbury. There are four stages of emotional <coughs> intelligence. He likes to begin at the top with self-awareness. If I am aware of myself, I know my emotions, I know how to name them, I don't label them as good or bad, they just are. I allow myself to experience an emotion when I have it. I know how it feels when I'm having an emotional reaction. So I know what my body feels like when I'm happy. I know what my body feels like when I'm happy, different than when I'm ecstatic, because those are two emotions on the same spectrum of the same emotion, but they feel <coughs> different in my body. I know what my body feels like when I'm angry. I know what my body feels like. I know what my body feels like. Those are really important triggers to self-awareness. Here's the thing about emotions. There's six identified emotions. But for each emotion, there is a spectrum of its experience. And the subtle nuances of that experience is what allows us to connect with someone and make the distinction between, oh, you're not just... Um, confused, you are downright overwhelmed. Perhaps the same emotional state but a different spectrum and that connects me deeper to you because all of a sudden you go, yes, you know how I feel. Yes. What, is, what are those things? Oh, fear, happy, sad, angry, surprised, <laughs> disgust. Oh, yes! <laughs> going to come. Thank you. <laughs> um, when I work on my self-awareness, I automatically get better at the other three stages in this model. Automatically improve. And they actually equated a dollar value. If I improve my self-awareness by one point on the week test, I earn $1,800 more. One point. That's pretty incredible, isn't it? I think it's pretty incredible couldn't use 1800 bucks. That's a really cheap vacation, but it's a vacation. Self-awareness floats into self-management. Once I understand my emotions, I can name them, I know what they feel like, then I can manage them better. So I can manage how I express them, how I communicate them to somebody else. I can manage when, at the right frequency, to the right amount, to pick the right emotion with the right person. So when I do this in a very effective way, what ends up happening? It really impacts my relationship management. Ooh, I touched the screen. <laughs> Social awareness, sandwiched in between here, is my ability to understand and see emotions in other people. Um, anyone here like to people watch? Love it. What are you looking for when you're people watching? Expressions. Expressions. Something to laugh at. <laughs> Something to laugh at. Great. <laughs> Fashion. When you're watching people, what are you looking for? I mean, I know what I look for. I, I actually look to see if I can connect with them without talking. I look for the nonverbal cues that says to me, oh, you are just like me. Because something that I look for a lot is just connection, inclusion. I want to be part of the tribe. It's human nature to be part of the tribe. So when I people watch, I look for that. And body language is really indicative of how people are feeling. So if I know what I look like when I'm happy, probably other people look similar when they're happy. <laughs> and that's instant connection. My social awareness floats into my ability to manage my relationships. So mutually satisfying is a really key thing when we describe relationship management. It has to be equal for both parties. How many of you are in relationships at work where somebody is working harder than the other? for that relationship? Yes. <laughs> and we can even extend this into our personal life. 
We have relationships where someone is always working harder. Why is that? Well, according to emotional intelligence, if we work our way backwards, something's not lining up. What's not lining up? Something within this four stages is off. It wouldn't be awareness. You're not understanding each other. Someone's not understanding the other. Yeah, I might not even be understanding myself. And it's impacting all the way into my relationship. I may not understand why I don't want to call my mother on a regular basis. I've done the work. I already know why I don't want to call my mother on a regular basis. I've been working on my emotional challenges for a really long time. It is something that you always work on. Um, and so now we can see in a very sort of simplified definition or description of emotional intelligence. And I want to take you on a journey to something that's a little bit more complex. So this is where we've got this model that's on your uh, table. This one right here, created by your GFR on, this is the EQI 2.0 assessment. This assessment spits out your results in five rounds and 15 skills related to emotional intelligence. If you can take a look, you can look with your partner for a second, you will notice the five rounds are self-perception, self-expression, interpersonal, decision-making, and stress management. And then under each are skills related to emotional intelligence. So how many of you would have considered reality testing a skill in emotional intelligence? How would you describe reality testing? Well, you are super smart, but why? <laughs> <laughs> I would say, um, you know, some people, when they suffer from depression and other things, are not able to see the real reality. So the ability to see what is really happening around you and what's happening in the world, mm -hmm. as it relates to you and your emotions, mm -hmm. are emotional matters. Yeah, absolutely. What if I'm a rose-colored glass wearer? Because perhaps one of my other skills in emotional intelligence, optimism, is highly developed. And so all I see is the world through this lens of amazingness, hopefulness. My reality testing is underdeveloped. So I come into everything with this little skip in my step, and you're just like, can I bring you down to earth for a second? And I'm like, no, I want to be up in the class, because everything's going to be amazing. And all of a sudden, you have this emotional intelligence skill clash, where someone needs to dial down their optimism, and somebody else needs to dial up their optimism, and someone needs to dial up the reality testing, and someone else needs to dial their down, so you can meet in the middle and have a conversation. Who would have considered problem solving under decision making an emotional intelligence skill? Isn't that an IQ skill? Is my ability to solve a problem based on my intelligence? So, not exclusively. Not exclusively. <coughs> so what I find really valuable is, is asking myself and asking other people to imagine what it sounds like, that, like that kind of difference. Mm -hmm. Because that's how we mostly interrelate is through conversation. So I always like that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And for me, that mismatch always sounds like you, you need to see the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Or you don't see the potential here. Mm -hmm. Those are the words that can be exchanged when there's those kinds of mismatches. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, when we're not aligned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this particular model of emotional intelligence is a cyclical model. Um, I wish I would have had one. You know those balls that um, are really colorful and they sort of are linked by hard plastic, hard plastic, and you can do this with them? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's like could do right now. You do this. <laughs> this is how I would like you to see this model. It's more like a sphere as opposed to a flat circle. And all of those sticks <laughs> that create this sphere are of equal <coughs> length. When I shrink the ball, I have a low or small development of emotional intelligence, and I'm not using my skills. But when I expand the ball, I have well-developed emotional intelligence skills, and I'm using them all in a balanced way. This is the important thing about emotional intelligence, is I have to use all of the skills balanced. I cannot have assertiveness well-developed and empathy not well-developed, because that's just going to look like aggression or passive aggressive. 
And so when we do this with the ball, <laughs> we want to know that when our emotional intelligence is under assessment, when we're tested under this assessment, we want to be able to see that all of our emotional intelligence skills are far to the right-hand side, <laughs> and they're all equally balanced. So I've got a demonstration of all of them in equal amounts. And emotionally intelligent people are then capable of knowing which skills they need to use when and in what amount. So if I'm emotionally intelligent, and I, I've been tested, and I'm pretty good. <laughs> I've been tested multiple times, and I'm getting better every time. Um, I know that I have to watch out for certain things, because my personality also influences my emotional intelligence. My IQ also influences my emotional intelligence, because my emotional intelligence helps me to leverage my IQ. It helps me to leverage my ability or aptitude to learn. But my IQ can also be a barrier of learning things around emotional intelligence. My personality can be a barrier around learning things in emotional intelligence. If I'm an introvert under my personality, I may find it quite difficult to do some of these things. And I may sort of cap out in my ability to grow my emotional intelligence. But it can get better than where I am right now. When I talk about, um, sorry, sorry, getting up to So when we look at this model compared to the last model we saw in four stages, this is cyclical. When I work on my self-perception inside, how I see myself and understand my emotions and what I think of them, that influences my ability to express myself to the outside world, my self-expression. How do other people see my emotions showing up? When I do that well, I can build really strong interpersonal relationships. So if I express myself well, whether I'm happy, sad, angry, frustrated, afraid, disgusted, if I do that well with someone, then we can have really strong relationships. That strong relationship leads me to make really good decisions. Because if I consider other people in my decision-making process, in all likelihood, my decisions are better. <laughs> when I make good decisions, I'm able to manage my stress. When my stress level is low, guess how I feel about myself? Two thumbs up, right? and my self-regard or self-perception is high. If my self-perception is high, I express myself properly to other people, which builds good relationships, and this circle of emotional intelligence just goes on and on and on, until trauma. Something happens that sends me off kilter. And what do most of us call that is usually in this realm. Stress shows up in one way or another. And when stress shows up, what do you do? Grind my teeth. Grind your teeth. So you have a physical expression of when you're stressed out. Grind your teeth. What else do you do? You don't really think about what you say too much beforehand. Okay. <laughs> so over here is being impacted. What else happens? Lose sleep. Lose sleep. I become more sensitive to other other people's remarks. I start, I start taking things personally. Oh, so I did use that tone, and what did you mean by that? And mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I love that you know how it's showing up. Generally become less skillful. <laughs> yes. So more yeah. Yes, love it. Shut down. Shut down completely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> situation, but power off. So what are you doing about more stress? Well, drinking, some of you, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Smoking? <laughs> Smoking, okay, good, yep. Anyone have a healthy <laughs> habit to manage their stress? Today I flew a kite. Flew a kite? Awesome. <laughs> mm. I was not expecting that. That is a great workplace yoga. Workplace <laughs> yoga. So how many people here exercise? Good. Yeah. Okay. How many people here journal? You guys okay. Or mindful meditation. Good. Getting up to play with your friends. How many blow off steam just by venting? And it has to be helpful, right? It has to be healthy venting. You've got to get it out so I can move on. So retrospective support. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so stress is one of those things that shows up the most. And it is usually easily identified in ourselves. We can usually pick it up. We have some maybe um, triggers and usually physical triggers and that's really important to know because stress management is right beside self-regard. So you have to know 
how your triggers make you feel so you can stop them before they influence everything else. That's emotional intelligence. When a stimulus comes into our body, first goes into our brainstem, this is just a little bit about how the brain works, and our brainstem is our reptilian brain, fight or flight. Now, if it's not life-threatening, if that stimulus isn't life-threatening, I'm not gonna fight and I'm not gonna flight. Well, unless you're me, I'll use the example. Unless he gives me a little nudge in the rib and I punch him really hard in the arm. used to be a kickboxer, so there's a bit of sting behind that. So, <laughs> that I could say that's because of my training <laughs> as a kickboxer that I'm just really quick to react. But no, I, I really don't like being poked in the ribs and I sometimes have a difficult time controlling my reaction. And usually my reactions are physical and abrupt. So that's emotional hijacking. Anyone else get emotionally hijacked on occasion? Yeah, it happens to the best of us. So, where was I? Lose your brain. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> when it's not life threatening, I'm not fighting or flighting. And that stimulus comes into my limbic system, which is my emotion center. And my emotion center is connected to my physical self. It's all of my senses. So I feel my emotions before that stimulus comes to the front of my brain, my cortex, which is where I can think about them rationally. Now, I don't know about you, but the first time I learned this, I went, oh, that's why I'm not rational. Is because my brain is set up for me to react, feel, and then think. And our emotional brain is much older than our thinking brain. So emotional intelligence trains us to uh, dampen the hijacking. It trains us to go, oh, I'm in tune with my body, and I know how my body feels. So if there's one thing you take away from tonight, is to get used to how your body feels in emotional states. This is usually the first exercise I give every single client, is I want you to keep track all week in a little notebook or on your phone, I don't care how you do it, of the temperature of your body when you wake up in the morning. How do I feel today? I feel light, I feel airy. What's the emotion? Oh, I'm happy, great. <laughs> How do you feel this afternoon? I'm feeling kind of sluggish. I'm feeling kind of down in the duck, in the dumps. What's the emotion? I'm bored, I'm down bored. And this cataloging heightens your awareness of how you physically feel when you're experiencing an emotion. And that connection can be the only thing you do in emotional intelligence and it completely transforms your life. Can you imagine giving this skill to every one of your teammates? Or everyone that you know on the planet? I'm just more aware. What does awareness do to us? Think about climate change. What does awareness do? It prompts action. It prompts action. It makes us behave differently. If we're all under the same um, practice, of watching our emotions and how we feel, we we not maybe hold each other accountable to that as well, perhaps? Or we more in tune with saying, <coughs> you're in the front, so I'm going to be picking on you all the time. Yep. You might want to check yourself before <coughs> you step into that meeting. I'm noticing you're a little off. <laughs> and I would go, that's right, I'm a little off. I'm not paying attention to how I'm feeling right now. So I'm getting myself straight, and then I can head into this situation much more effective, much more impactful and more capable of getting what it is that I probably really want to get out of this meeting or interaction that's coming up. Okay. I think that's enough of me. So how, this is the juicy part, this is where we get to talk about what are we experiencing on a regular basis? What are we seeing in our workplace? What are we seeing in our personal lives, and our social lives? We can keep this all workplace. We can talk about personal stuff. It doesn't really matter wherever we want the dialogue to go. Um, how are things showing up at work? What are you struggling with? What do you need help with? How are we going to be more emotionally intelligent, more successful at work, and do that for our teams? Who wants to go first? It's always the brave soul, whoever makes an icon. <laughs> so it's my experience that people are over-regulated they won't express big dry brush. But sure. typically people will not express how they're really feeling in a particular situation. And they, that's why I say overrated, kind of that went down. The associated professionalism with being level-headed and impassionate. Mm -hmm. Let's 
such a word. Neutral. Neutral. But that's not what they're really feeling. And uh, I had a moment of self-regulatory lapse today. <laughs> and I said something out loud that you should probably need it some context. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and I felt really badly about it afterwards, but uh, it, it was so, it was such an upwelling. I mean, like, how could you possibly be thinking that way? Um, that, uh, you know, just involuntarily escaped. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think we need more of that at work. Like, sure, tell me how you really feel about this thing. Mm -hmm. Because um, because how it shows up is we get together and have a meeting. Everybody's you know super logical and very superficial, and nice to one another, and we and there's complete disagreement about you know what it is we talk about, how we feel about what it is we talk about, and the decision we make based on that discussion. Mm -hmm. And so what ends up happening is people walk away and nothing gets done, or it gets sabotaged, or there's water cooler talk, and yeah. ooh, let's do this instead of that, ooh, what the, yeah. So how do we fix that? Uh, <laughs> uh, hire everyone. So we hire a few. <laughs> uh, I don't, but for me, there's two aspects to it, and I don't want to dominate this conversation anymore after this coming. But um, one is getting self-aware. Mm -hmm. I think people are not even aware that they're doing this. Mm -hmm. It's just so inculcated in our upbringing and the way that we get acculturated at work and in life. And, and it's funny because people who are not affected by that, you know, bracing once the, the, you know, they show up as leaders who are really definitive and directive and really appear not to give a shit. Uh, they're the ones who are seen to get stuff done. Mm -hmm. But they leave a big weight for them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and we tolerate that somehow. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, creating, uh, creating an environment where it's safe for people to express how they're truly feeling, mm -hmm. Sort of unvarnished reactions to the discussion that's going on or people's opinions. The uh, treading on people's self worth mm -hmm. is uh, one of the most important thing for us. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've learned over the years is if I am experiencing an emotional reaction from some sort of trigger and I have to be able to say out loud that I disagree or I'm really confused or I'm frustrated or something is pissing me off, the uh, target of my outburst, my emotional outburst, needs to be not the person. It needs to be the condition I'm looking for, I'm wanting, the process I need changed, the outcome I want to see happen. And that means that together, if I say, man, I'm so pissed off about how this is going, not with you. Let's look at it together. And we look at the thing that we're pissed off about. And they may say, well, I don't know why you're pissed off, because I'm not. You know, like, that's OK. What are you feeling? <laughs> and then we can embark on this discussion towards, well, do we need to be innovative? Do we need to be creative? Do we have to solve a problem? What do we have to do right now in this moment? And it allows people to have that psychological safety to say, I don't like this. It's not that I don't like you. It's when people feel the, the emotion is directed at them, that then the defense mechanism comes up and nobody wants to share. So one of the mechanisms that we really lean on for that in sort of agile practice, mm -hmm. team practice, is to establish a team agreement then if somebody is not honoring the agreement, it's not that they're a bad person, it's that the agreement is somehow something that we need to talk about. So we agreed that we would meet every morning at 9 o'clock and you seem unable to honor that agreement. Mm -hmm. How can we make it easier for you to participate in this group discussion? We need to move it. Yeah, how, do you, to, how, how do, do you get yourself agreement? to show up for 9? Yeah, it's not that Teresa, you're a bad person for not showing up at 9. It's right. that this agreement doesn't serve our mutual purpose. Right. It's the same as addressing 
um, the behavior, right? So being angry is okay, calling me a name, not okay. Being confused and frustrated, okay. Well, in your eyes, not okay. So I can address your behavior in a safe space saying, your emotions in this space, totally cool. We can have every emotion we want and we can accept all of them. You have to be able to express them in a way that is non-offensive and effective for other people. I can't use behaviors of eye rolling. So it's okay to be tired at 9 o'clock, but it's not okay to not show up. That's right. <laughs> you, yeah. <laughs> it's okay to be tired. It's not okay to fall asleep while I'm talking. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Just talking about um, safety. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if for this part of this discussion, people will be more comfortable if we were not video taping. I don't know if people want to are refraining oh. from saying things about their workplaces that they wouldn't necessarily want to be online. I just want on the record, I love my workplace. <laughs> I think what I was going to say, I Mostly think my manager. She's great. Yeah, it might be voice recognition. I don't know if you want to stop. It won't be on your face, it's just on mine. I think it's only on mine. Georgie, we were turning the camera too, right? So yeah. don't turn the camera. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so actually before we float around into the psychological safety, let's talk a little bit about developing emotional awareness in other people, right? So if, you are, if you're a peer to someone, sometimes it's easier when you're a peer to be able to pull the peer aside and say, I've been noticing some behaviors that well, I'm concerned about. It might get you in trouble at work. I, mean, I really care about you and I want you to be successful, so can we have a chat about what I'm seeing? This is what I'm observing. What's going on? And provide for them a safe environment to be able to open up and say, I'm experiencing all of these things, not, none of them related to work, and it's really coming into my workplace. Well, guess what? People have to show up authentically in the workplace. So they're going to bring home to work, and they're going to bring work to home. You cannot separate these things. And I personally believe we're lying if we think people can do that. If you want people to show up authentically as themselves and give their best, you have to accept that they're going to come with their whole life <laughs> everywhere that they go. And if you want people to be able to express their emotions in a really constructive way, you have to allow them to bring their whole life with them. Otherwise, they're just going to suppress everything. So when we pick up on those triggers from either teammates or peers, what's important in creating psychological safety is doing those physical things that let people know, hey, I'm invested and I want to be in this space with you, and if you want to talk to me about it, I'm, I'm willing and ready to talk to you about it. And perhaps I might not be the one to come up with all the solutions, but I'm here to be able to bounce off of whatever it is that you need from me. I'm ready to be in it with you. Peer-to-peer -peer can sometimes be very easy. Manager to employee also can be very easy. But difficult if you don't have that relationship yet. So if you're a leader of people and you need to establish a team that works together really well and gets stuff done really fast and can come into a retrospective and be able to talk about, well, this didn't go well and that didn't go well and this is how we have to change things, that new person has to feel a level of trust and compassion that is at the highest level possible from their first day. Because they have to be able to step in and say, well, this is what I thought. You can't be intimidated by someone who's been there for 10 years longer than they have been. But they also can't feel unsafe to be able to do that. So as the manager, it's your job to be able to create trust and compassion at the highest level with every single one of your people. So they can do the same for every other member of your team, and especially the new people that come into it. Psychological safety first comes from me feeling safe. Oh, <laughs> my picture. It comes from here, my self-perception. Um, I found a little psychoanalyst. Self-regard is an exploration into our whole life that has been behind us. It requires us to look at why do I have a certain set of beliefs and values and thoughts about things based on how I was raised and influenced from the time I was born. So your entire personality is pretty much structured by the time you're set, done. 
in stone. Doesn't change ever. Your IQ peaks by the time you're 18. Your aptitude to learn doesn't change anymore. The only thing that changes after that is your EQ if you decide to work on it. So consider that your maybe the average age in here is 36. Sure. Sure. <laughs> 42? 42? And perhaps you're, you're um, resonating with some of the things that, you're, that are being said. You're like, that's me. I don't hear people say speaking up and saying things. And I, I cloud how I feel and I present to people what I think they want to see. And I do that because I think that's what's going to help me be successful. And then I go home and I crap all over myself for not being myself because it's really hard to wear that shield all day long. That exploration into why you believe things is your self-regard. It's knowing your strengths and weaknesses. It's your self-actualization, the constant pursuit to be better. To be better, you have to look at, well, why am I not better yet? What is holding me back? What beliefs have been reinforced from the time I was really young that I still believe in? Why do I still believe in them? Are they true? Probably not. They've just been reinforced. So you choose to believe something different. And that choice to believe something different usually allows you to stand more firmly in your authentic self and say, I don't like this. I would like to see a change. And do it in a way that resonates with your personality, that resonates with your intelligence, and that makes sense to other people. Okay, the three of you, you wanted to be able to, you had something that you wanted to bring into the discussion. No, I didn't. I was just as the, one of the only oh, wondered if we should just turn of the group Got wanted it. to turn off the camera. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just a, a situation where like I facilitate a lot of meetings, and so sometimes it's individual contributors and it's retrospectives or it's design meetings. Sometimes it's senior leaders, um, and sometimes conflict sparks. And I find when conflict sparks in a meeting, I like. Pull back. Like, I cannot engage in that. If, or if I did engage, I engage like, blah! You know, like I just, I lose my temper, I get caught up in it, or I shut down. So do you have, I don't know, like what are some cues along yeah. that road and some vocabulary that I can use then when the conflict breaks out and I want to moderate it in a way that's emotionally intelligent? <laughs> yeah, so there's two skills here in particular. Assertiveness and empathy are the two that jump out. And then the other one I want to want you to sort of draw your eye towards is flexibility. So we've got a couple of different um, realms involved. So flexibility is the ability for me to change my beliefs and thoughts regardless of my emotional state or because of my emotional state. So even if my emotions are heightened and in conflict, I disagree with you, being flexible means well, I can change my beliefs and I can change my thoughts and I can change my ideas. But can I do that if I'm not empathetic to the other person? If I do not understand the other person's perspective, will I be very flexible? I need to use both of these skills really quite well. Empathy is the ability to see someone else's perspective. Not agree with their perspective, see it, understand it. So I like to use this example of how many people here get enraged like in a rage when someone cuts you off in traffic. <laughs> you do things like flip up the birds. Swear, regardless of the child in the back seat. <laughs> I've never done this. <laughs> I know people who do this. Now, have you ever been enraged? Maybe not because someone cut you off, but you had that level of a reaction to something? So you understand that level of anger, not because of getting cut off. You know, someone cuts me off and I just kind of go, well, whatever. Sometimes I don't go, whatever. Sometimes I go, another scratcher. <laughs> so empathy and flexibility at the same time allows you to see the proverbial other side of the beach ball. It opens up the space for time for the other person to, can you tell me a little bit more about what you mean? Can you explain in more detail how you came to this conclusion? Because oftentimes what I'm fighting against is I don't really understand. 
your side of the well, you're giving me a solution. I don't know how you got there. So maybe if you gave me some more details, I could come around. Assertiveness is the third one we throw into the mix. So assertiveness is, is often a word that people don't like because they define it in a wrong way. What does assertive mean to you? Does it look like this? This looks defensive. This doesn't look assertive. Is this assertive? Better. <laughs> so assertive is simply my ability to state my ideas, to state my beliefs, to state my feelings in a way that is non-offensive, non-destructive. That's what assertiveness is. It's not proving my point. It's not being right. <laughs> so if you put assertiveness and empathy and flexibility into the same circle of conflict, you've got an open opportunity for people to share. So when we feel the tension rising in the room, the best thing to do is to incorporate something like maybe a safe word. Like maybe you want to use beach ball, or maybe you have one in the room. And just go, what's the other side that we're not seeing? Can you say back to me what they just said? So can you demonstrate empathy in the moment? Am I understanding the other person's perspective, or am I still seeing it through my own colored lens? Those are some of the practices in conflict. Conflicts are OK. Being mean to each other is not OK. So you can establish some of those rules as well, if you would like. Good, seeing whether or not, helpful. What else do we have? Who's going to throw the next one into the pond? Yes. Um, when I was in my place, it's actually the converse, or the inverse of what you've been discussing, where there's an emphasis on wanting to appreciate people's feelings, and then a lot of vacillation, and, and not a lot of actual action taking place. And I'm wondering, if there's a way to, uh, what you would suggest to help people move from that into maybe perhaps more of the decision making so that people on the other side are trying to balance that and be more attention to Where we want to drive toward the innovation, creativity, problem solving, and yes. time to do yes. things. Yes. Because what I, what I notice is those of us who don't lean as much to the human side of things uh, aren't aren't growing in that way because we are focused on trying to balance the fact that there's already so much healing happening in the world. And so we're trying to go with the solution trying to mm. hmm. Sorry. No, that's okay. I might need you to be a little bit more specific. Can you describe a scene? So um, there's a want to move forward with the project, but there's a concern that uh, it's going to um, not be taken well by some of the team members because they have not been on it and it was their baby, for example. Um, and instead of focusing on, there, there's, there's no discussion about alternative options that, like that, but more, how do we make sure this person is not Okay. You are not responsible for how other people react. You cannot own someone else's emotion. You can only own how you address it with them and how you care for them. So how do you encourage people to develop that? Of caring about the other person? Of not worrying about owning somebody else's emotion. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it took me a while. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's OK. Um, one of the things that happens in that environment is when we think about barriers that prevent us from stepping into, a lot of the times it's our perception, right? And um, if I happen to have a personality which amplifies other people's emotional reactions, it will be difficult for me to go into any interaction because I'm just taking everything to the 19th level. So one of the things that really helps with that is thinking about interpersonal relationships. So if I get to know the people I work with better, I will stop or I'll minimize 
how uh, how much I do that, how much I amplify <coughs> their emotional reaction. My ability to know people um, intimately is a really good strategy for teams. So, so if I know you outside of the workplace, <laughs> and I know your likes, your interests, um, I know how you are at home with your family, with your friends. If I know these things about you, then I will stop sort of fantasizing how you're going to react to everything in, in, this, in this broad spectrum. And developing empathy, I mean it's such a big one, it comes up almost all the time. Developing empathy so that when I go into a conversation, I start it with language that's indicative of what I don't want is to blank. What I do want is to play. And when I insert these in that order, it helps them to listen to the do want. If, this, if I start with what I want, the person just goes, shoo, all I hear is what you want, and you don't care about me at all. But if I go what I don't want, then I go, okay, what they don't want, and this is what they're trying not to do. It's kind of like when someone comes up to you and says, you might be offended with what I'm about to say. <laughs> that never works well. Usually <laughs> <laughs> when somebody says that, all of a sudden, well, I'm already offended, and I don't even know what you're going to say. You just set me up for failure. But if you tell me, what I don't want to do is offend you, I'm like, okay, so you don't want to be offensive, so now I'm looking at it through the lens of caring. What I do want is to be able to, and then you share what you do want. So we have two things, working on interpersonal relationships and getting people to connect on a more personal level. And then working on empathy when I go into conversations to use statements like what I don't want, what I do want. That can be helpful. Teaching people to not own someone else's emotions is, um, it's, that can be very difficult because that can be a learned behavior. <coughs> I, I may have been trained my whole life that I'm second and they are first. And so I put everyone before myself. And, and that's a really difficult, I mean, how do you safely guide someone to that exploration? Yeah, you give them my card. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, something that pops up to me in this discussion is, is uh, over-reliance on uh, emotional resonance as the meaning of empathy, yep. and, and I appreciate that you've been taking this perspective taking uh, view of it, because I think that's much more valuable, personally, but something that if, if we overemphasize or over-index on uh, asking people how they feel, mm -hmm. then we're going to get that kind of mm -hmm. uh, emphasis on feeling. And something that has been useful for me is, instead of asking people how they're feeling about something is asking for their reaction. Hmm. Now you may get back and have this emotional reaction. Mm -hmm. But more typically you get back, here's how I'm thinking about this thing. Which may be extremely angry with you, but my reaction. How do you bring that? Like you're in a conversation and you say something about your reaction to that? Yeah. Well here's your proposal, what's your reaction? Like instead of here's your proposal, how are you feeling about it? Or uh, in a retrospective, the team members are obviously agitated. So we have all of these things that have happened. What's your reaction to that? Instead of going into a, a, a team discussion about, oh, tell me how you're feeling about everything that's going in the last you know, iteration. They get all excited. But if you ask for their reaction, then somehow it's a very subtle difference between the two. It seems to work. It's like all it's the same as asking, what do you think? And then they just give you the cerebral process and they leave out the emotion. Well they leave out they leave out saying the emotion, but they don't leave out showing you the emotion. Yeah. And, and their language choices <laughs> How do you deliver something? I think similar to your story now. How do you deliver something someone that you know they're not gonna like what they're being told? You know it's outside of the decision that the decision made and this is the path or this is where we're going. Yep. And you know you're gonna get a reaction before you ask for it. <laughs> so how do you uh, manage that? Just because you know from the person that um, they're reactive in situations mm -hmm. or they're defensive or they, we've all worked with somebody who feels they have control over the whole dominion. Mm -hmm. um, how do you work with that knowing that you have this nugget that you have to deliver and 
any amount of, hey, soft chat talk beforehand, you know, how's your weekend, how's your dog, or anything like that. As soon as you utter those words of this, that was it, they're gonna have a reaction that's gonna be high on the scale, whether it be, you know, increased yelling, volume, rolling eyes, or doing those kind of things. You already know that's coming. How do you deal with that? Well, in private, number one, that would be my first recommendation, is you always do things that, that you know are going to be really sensitive for someone in private, so they have the physical space that they need to have whatever sort of reaction they need to have. Okay? And if this is someone you're close enough to, it's a balance of a couple of things around independence and problem solving. So when, when we are leaders, oftentimes, we have to make decisions on our own, right? And leaders have to have a developed independence skill, which is, um, I am free from the emotional dependency of other people. So I don't rely on other people to help me make decisions. Now you see that's unbalanced with some of the other emotional intelligence skills and you might be missing a lot of value in this issue. So problem solving requires to be used in the same team is that when I'm problem solving, I am considering the emotions of other people in my decision making process when I go to solve a problem, but I'm free from the dependency. So their emotional states are influencing my decision. But I am considering their emotions when I make my decision. You see how that teacher taught her stuff? <laughs> so something that can be incredibly valuable is explaining to these people the process you took to make the decision. The emotional state you considered from them, the emotional state you considered of all the people on your team. And in your delivery, you're not just saying, this is the decision. You say, this is what happened, this was the process, this is the decision that needs to be made. This is what I'm looking for. What if you already know that thought pattern that you're going to go walk through them with? You know the parts where they're not going to see eye to eye. Because you've taken that perspective. Mm -hmm. you looked at it on the other side of it, and you've seen they're not going to see it in this light. Mm -hmm. And they're attached. And you know from previous conversations, they're attached to this. Yes. And sometimes it's not you're the one making that choice or that decision. Sure. But you're having to form that kind of bring in of that. And it's how to help them. How are people move forward when they don't agree? A little bit of that, but how do you help people kind of start to get in touch with their emotional intelligence and realize that that I'm in it with you. Yeah. I'm not doing this to you. Right, right. And this is not, I'm out to sink you and this is my choice and I conspire to get this going. Yes. But actually get them to see your side of it, which you already know that they're classically saying. So the thing that you actually just said, I'm not out to sabotage you, I'm not out to get you, I'm not doing this to you, are actually great statements you can use in the moment. Whether they hear them or not, I mean, you can't really control it, right? And then an exercise in optimism can be something that, that can be useful, especially if this is the person who does this over and over and over again, but things worked out, and then down the road they're kind of like, oh, it worked out, so I guess that's okay is that you can use that exercise and optimism to force them back into, you remember when we did this last time and you were not sort of in the realm of moving where we needed to move and everything worked out well? I need you to trust that this is gonna happen again. Can, can you remember times when you didn't agree, you did the work and things turned out fine? So an exercise and optimism can be something that is helpful to carry them through that process a little bit faster. Can, can I add something there? No, I don't really have one. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, I'm just wondering, when you say that you're, you're trying to make the person feel that this is not something that you're imposing on them, particularly if you're, you're their manager, uh, is there real evidence that you involve them in the process of decision making? Because this, this usually drops a lot of barriers. It's like, you know, we, we've gone through this together, you're familiar with why we, take, we took some of those decisions. Because there, there's always going to be the impact of yeah. dropping a bomb on someone that's completely unaware of someone that, something that's happening, right? So you kind of like give them space to also digest that. Because, it, you know, anyone is going to get surprised at, at, at the news. So I'm just wondering, you know, not just in the moment where it's going to be a tough conversation, but how do you gradually prepare? I think sometimes it's that um, from different departments, it's um, the inclusion of them in different areas. They can't always be in those decisions, like from the ground up into those decision making things. Not everybody can be 
in that process. Right. And, um, I think sometimes for some people, when they're actually hearing that, and that's come in and that's happened outside, they feel excluded. Mm -hmm. And they feel that, well, if I had been a part of it, I could have gotten them to go the other direction. <laughs> And so I think a little bit of it is, is that side of it that, um, and I know it's a little bit on the emotional intelligence because that's what you're dealing with the reaction of how long do you consider that to be an appropriate reaction to that and how long do you sit there and go, I'm tampering myself and I'm tampering you know, what I'm doing to accommodate the reaction I know I'm gonna get from this person as opposed to being more assertive that like, you know, this is you know, within my control, this is within our department. This direction. So those kind of things. Um, and sometimes it's about managing the expectation, right? So if you're not allowed to blow up for 10 minutes, then you have to just sort of bookmark it. You have 10 minutes to get it all out, and then it's time for us to move forward. Potentially, then what we want to do is talk about so what are the strengths you're going to bring to the table on this approach that we're taking? And then we talk about well, how are you actually going to get involved? And I don't list them out, they do. So if you engage in them, so if this is the direction, all of your strengths, which are, List them off for you. Good, we're going to need all of them to actually move forward in this direction. The more it's like entertaining the brat, the more you fuel the fire, the more you fuel the fire of that behavior, right? The more, the more you give it to them and allow it to sort of foster into something bigger, the bigger it's going to get. Give an inch, take a mile. I don't know how many you come up with. Come on, <laughs> Can I just pause for one second? It's 6.30, we have the room as long as we want. Holy as crap. long as you're good to say, I think the dialogue is amazing, but I did just want to give a window in case there's someone who needs to sneak out. Is that fair? Yeah, that's totally fair. Dana, Dana, double Dana, thanks for coming. Thank you, though. Oh, you're welcome, it's a pleasure. Excuse me. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that I think the first thing that I would say to previous discussion uh, is uh, personality type uh, uh, I'm listening personality type yeah if it's a factor in the, in the context of previous discussion yeah I mean uh, yes it definitely I think this is a really good question is personality part of the dynamic so if we think about IQ EQ and personality are three separate circles. They don't overlap with each other. But personality and IQ will absolutely influence what can happen in any sort of dynamic conversation, right? So whether I have um, the aptitude to see what you're doing as my supervisor and the way you're doing it, whether I have the personality that is flexible enough to shift, whether I have the emotional intelligence to actually temper my own and manage my own emotional state are all three facets that are working separately but together. Does that make sense? For the whole human being, right? So I mean we would encourage that every member of our team become emotionally intelligent. This is going to identify every single player on your team as a great team member. They're all emotional, right? Can't be wrong. <laughs> Everybody's emotionally intelligent. We have great individuals, which means we have awesome teams that are working together because we're using all of these skills that create overall well being, that create dynamic social and emotional functioning that increases our performance. That's the gray ring on the outside of the circle. Emotional intelligence influences those four things. The first thing people will notice when they start to work on their emotional intelligence is they feel better. Their overall well-being is improved. How do we define well-being? Well, it's an, indi an indicator is our happiness level. Happiness is actually the only emotional success indicator for or indicator for success. Mm -hmm. so, happiness is the only indicator for success or marker. Isn't that great? Success, not the other way around. Well, success well, equals happiness. Well, happiness. Well, But okay. if, if you are in a room, uh, 
statistically speaking, you have all types of personalities. Yes. Right? So absolutely. then, if uh, if you address the room uh, in a specific way, let's say if you are direct, you are happy with uh, type A, but I'm happy with C and D. Yeah. Right. So then doesn't matter which way you approach, some, some people will be unhappy. Uh, yeah, sometimes you run that risk. It's just like here, right? In this group of people, some people wanted to learn things, some people didn't want to learn things, some people like a certain type of pres presenter and presentation style, and don't but, uh, not be able to please everybody in the room. <laughs> I think that's a matter of authenticity. Sure. Like, you're, whatever I talk to, people on my team, the same message has to be framed differently depending on who I'm talking to, if it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, right? But if I'm doing a group presentation, there's my personality, that's what I have to be authentic to, right? It can't be the worst outcome in that scenario is I deliver a message and everybody says, no, that's not what it really wants, right? That's what So I think so long as I'm authentic to my personality, that's how I deliver that message. Yeah, we can use feedback as a great example of this. So based on the person that's across from me, I change my Style based yes. on how they like to receive feedback. It's a classic managerial skill set. Is as soon as you become a manager, you meet with every single one of your people and you ask them, how do you like to receive feedback? Because then you will deliver it in the way that they are most receptive to it. You don't deliver it in the style that you like. Because they're just not going to listen most of the time unless they like exactly the same thing that you like. Thank you. 